<laughs> Francis Ford Coppola's The Godfather follows the exploits of crime boss Don Vito Corleone, played by Marlon Brando, the head of the most powerful of the five New York crime families. Don Corleone expands his family's power, prestige and influence in the early 20th century. He is a man of integrity and cunning intelligence, a man to be respected but also feared. Given his influence in the legitimate world, including having judges and law enforcement in his pocket, his connections are jealously courted by rival gangsters, such as the envious Emilio Barzini. When Vito is the subject of an assassination attempt, he takes a back seat while recovering from his bullet wounds, with his son Sonny taking charge of the family as a wartime don, engaged in a furious battle on multiple fronts with the other families. Though Sonny showed his prowess in times of war, his anger led to his downfall and his own father considered him a bad don. And Fredo, the middle son? Fredo? Well, Fredo. Anyway, eventually it is Michael Corleone who takes the reins of his family. Ironic that father and son did not see eye to eye for years, both men wanting a life away from the mafia for Michael. The intelligent young son and the cunning aging Don concoct a master plan to vanquish their enemies. All the while, Vito's sharpness starts to fade over time through age and having gone into semi-retirement. Before the plan can be actualized, Vito is in his garden playing with his grandson, Anthony. He plays a little trick on him by putting some oranges in his mouth, a little nod to the fact that Marlon Brando was actually wearing a mouthpiece throughout the film to give Don Corleone a bulldog-like look. He chases Anthony throughout the tomato garden before his hacking coughs overtake him. He suffers a heart attack, eventually collapsing while Anthony looks over his body before running inside for help. We stay with Vito's body momentarily, before we fade to the great man's funeral, where the sharks begin to swarm around Michael, now alone without the guidance of his father. But Vito had left his son with all the tools he needed to continue with their great plan. It's interesting that though Vito's death scene is in the book the film is based on, it's thought that Paramount Pictures, for various reasons, including money, did not allow Francis Ford Coppola to shoot Vito's death scene. They would have simply gone from Vito and Michael talking in the garden to Vito's funeral, with the studio execs feeling the audience would know what had happened and showing Vito's death was not necessary. Coppola thought the scene was essential however, and he took Marlon Brando, a small crew and three cameras to a private residence in Long Island, with the garden being created from scratch and essentially shot the sequence in secret. There's much that can be said about Vito's final scene in the film. The fact that he died playing with his grandson echoes his famous words earlier in the film, a man who doesn't spend time with his family can never be a real man, showing to us that Vito practiced what he preached and above all else, he was a family man who did what he did for the betterment of his family. He was a husband and father long before he became a mob boss and it was through circumstance that he became involved in a life of crime. He knew just how dangerous gangsters could be, how they preyed on the innocent, having lost his parents and older brother to the cruel dons of the old world. As such, he defiantly refused to be bullied by the likes of Don Fanucci and chose to make his own destiny, so to speak, rather than allow it to be shaped by others. And so he left a successful legacy, an empire for his children to inherit and he allowed himself to unwind, to slow down in his final years knowing that his able son was there to take over. He stopped to smell the roses now, he could afford to indulge in life's little luxuries, he drank more, he tended to the garden, to his grandchildren, he gained weight. The book even tells us he suffered a small heart attack a while before he dies, which also set him back and pushed Michael further into the forefront. The book tells us that Vito told others that he tended to his tomato vines for his health, but secretly he loved the sight of it as it brought him back to his early childhood in Sicily before the days of terror when his father was killed. On the day of his death, Vito was cautious about watering the plants just in time, with the sun becoming hot. Prudence, prudence, he thought to himself, a word that perhaps best summarises his entire character. Immediately, the Don felt pain inside him and knew that death was approaching. In the book, he doesn't quite die alone surrounded by his tomatoes and blissful grandson. Anthony manages to call his father and Michael and some goons run to the garden, finding Vito lying prone, clutching at handfuls of earth. He's lifted and carried into the shade, 
and while the other men call for an ambulance, Michael kneels by his father's side, holding his hand while his life slips away from him. It takes a great deal of effort for the Don to open his eyes to see his son one last time. He smells the garden and whispers, Life is so beautiful, before dying, his hand held in the hands of his son. Michael thought long about his father's final words. The book tells us that he thought, If I can die saying, Life is so beautiful, then nothing else is important. If I can believe in myself that much, nothing else matters. He would follow his father, he would care for his children, his family, his world, but his children would grow in a different world. They would be doctors, artists, scientists, governors, presidents, anything at all. He would see to it that they joined the general family of humanity, but he, as a powerful and prudent parent, would most certainly keep a weary eye on that general family. It's highly ironic that Michael had such thoughts, as these were pretty much the goals that his own father had, and yet, one of his sons died in his own lifetime, the other was a disappointment, and the one son who was supposed to leave the life and make something of himself instead replaced his father as boss of the family. The irony is further emphasised when you consider the events of the second film, where Michael ostracises his family, throws his wife out of the house, kills his brother, and then in the third film, though his son becomes a success in the legitimate world, his daughter is killed because of Michael's inability to leave the life, and he dies alone in Sicily. Who knows what Michael was thinking in his final moments, but something tells me it wasn't exactly life is beautiful. He died alone, reminiscing about the past, in an empty place that looked like purgatory on earth, whereas Vito plays with the future, quite literally, through his progeny, in a garden, with gardens often being used to describe what lies in heaven in religious scripture. Vito made this garden himself, a metaphor for his life, whereas Michael, metaphorically, made a barren land where his family are distant from him. The line somewhat highlights that Vito, unlike Michael, never lost sight of what he did and why he did it. Rather than go out in a blaze of glory in a street shootout, or being ridden with bullets when he goes out to buy some oranges, Vito died at home in his garden with his grandson, and in the book, it's his actual son. Michael is somewhat frustrated that his father could not have lived a little longer to witness the comeback of the Corleone family. But by the time Vito died, the cogs had started turning and Michael was more than capable enough to see the job through, in spite of his subordinates not being sure he was up to the task. Going back to Vito's death, yes, the death symbolises his family values, but with him putting oranges in his mouth and making a scary face, it brings up the other side of Vito, the frightening, ruthless side, the monster. How far can we go when we call Vito a family man? Did he not order death? Was he not involved in all manner of illegitimate things? Is his face of a monster the real Vito Corleone, one that frightens his grandson as it did Michael all those years ago when he realised what his father was actually like? Is that the actual Vito Corleone? Or is it itself a mask, a terrifying persona that Vito had to adopt to keep his enemies scared and his subordinates in line? Did Anthony, for a split second, see the real Vito Corleone for the monster he was? How should Vito be remembered? Should we accept that Vito came from a world where violence was part of his everyday existence, and that it was kill or be killed, control or be controlled? Or is he someone who chose to enact evil and exert his power over others, a monster who caused bloodshed? When Vito and Michael talk, it is clear that the power dynamic has shifted, that Michael, as he says, will handle it, he will make his own decisions, and for the first time in the film, we see Vito repeat himself, we see him forget. The power dynamic is reenacted between Vito and his grandson. Vito issues commands, over here, be careful, you're spilling it. But just like how he cannot control how Michael runs the family that he handed to him, the power that he passed down to the next generation, Vito cannot control how Anthony uses the water gun. How the next generation used the power that he created is out of his control. The water gun itself is interesting too. A man like Vito lived life by the way of the gun, and with this particular gun spitting out water, the source of life, it symbolises that Vito's power and his family's success all came from the gun, all came from violence. In any case, 
The fact that Vito died on his own terms means that in mob terms, he won. He passed in relative tranquility after having fun with his grandson. He's the only person in the first film who died a natural death. The final shot of Vito's death is one more distant, showing Vito's body resting on the soil, the foundation of the garden, much like how he was the foundation of his family. It's been his life's work, but now he was old and tired, and as the ripe tomatoes must fall to make way for new ones, so too must Vito fall in order to make way for the new Don, Michael. So what do you make of Vito Corleone's death scene? Do you prefer the way it went down in the book? Let me know in the comments below, subscribe to the channel and thanks for watching. Before we finish, I'd just like to thank my patrons, Nicholas Curtis, Andre Millington, Daniel P and Countess Von Zarovich, and also my channel members, Michael Awatwi, Rikers, Damien Irving, The New On Guam 24, Lan Deng, Joe Grossberg and Cam Medina.